First world. Simply put, I wouldn't be able to live past this day. System 5237 mutters over and over like a broken record, incessantly rolling back and forth beside Sui Yuan. Nowadays, everyone is striving to become male and female leads. Male and female supporting leads either give up too early or simply take over the storyline to counterattack. The world has been turned upside down, yee 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 yee, you must do your job properly this time ah, if you give me any trouble, I, I, I will drag you to hell with me, it should be destroy, Sui Yuan corrects absently, fine, you will be destroyed together with me, system 5237 chokes on its words for a little while, then says sternly, this is your first assignment, it's not too difficult, as long as you listen to me, I can guarantee you will cross this obstacle. Understood. Sui Yuan obediently nods his head. Having been through several partners, 5237 is not quite accustomed to having such an obedient companion. Recently, is there anyone who is not awfully shrewd, always making some bizarre request, or putting in a great effort all because they wish to receive more benefits? The kind of life 5237 is used to is one of sweet-talking its targets in order to bedazzle them with fantasies and sell itself. Afterwards, it will always be stuck in a long and laborious battle of wits. This short idle period of time, it is really not used to it. In actual fact, male supporting lead or whatever is a pretty good position. System 5237 wobblingly rubs Sui Yuan's elbow, stammering slightly. You see, male and female leads always have to weather all sorts of wind and rain in order to finally see the rainbow. They need to experience physical and mental oppression too. Supporting leads are very good ah, the only thing you would never measure up to or achieve is the deep emotion between you and the main, but being able to eat whenever you want, drink whatever you want, how unrestrained a life it is. Sui Yuan wordlessly nods, appearing to approve wholeheartedly. How rare that a companion would agree. System 5237's mood lifts higher and higher, right, right, and if you are a supporting lead made to be the male lead's rival to obtain the female lead's love, then the personality and ability would be very high ah, born to riches and wealth, handsome looks and natural talent will all be handed to you, as the saying goes, male leads are to develop the storyline, while male supporting leads are there to be loved, you must understand that outside of this world, there are countless younger sisters who love you ah, Sui Yuan continues to nod in agreement, expression serious, the most important thing is, a supporting male lead's sole oppression is never being able to obtain the female lead's love. But, as long as you are able to act appropriately, this minor thing will not be able to control you ah. All you need to do is act according to your role, it's actually very simple. System 5237 earnestly advises. Although some supporting male leads will die in the end, if you are good to me, I will definitely not allow you to meet such a tragic end. Sui Yuan still continues nodding without saying a word. The material benefits are also very great. If you accomplish your assignments splendidly, you will have the ability to make your own decisions. After you acquire this ability, when the time comes and you take a liking to someone, we can assist you in pursuing them. System 5237 rolls around Sui Yuan, then nudges him. Oi, are you listening? Hmm? You've finished talking. The Sui Yuan who took a mental journey to Fairyland eventually returns, blinking his eyes. System 5237, is this elder's presence so insignificant? QAQ. Sui Yuan raises a hand to pat the plump System 5237 who is currently sobbing rivers, trying to placate it. Nevertheless, 5237 is an experienced and knowledgeable being and swiftly gets over its grief. All right. It's time for take one. You are to fall for the female lead at first sight. 5237's body trembles as its fighting spirit skyrockets. You know what needs to be done, right? Got it. Sui Yuan looks at it, and nods expressionlessly once again. System 5237 feels that it is already beginning to hate this action of his. Sui Yuan gets to his feet and straightens the long sleeves of the garment he is wearing now. Luxurious crimson robes with gold embroidered designs serve to emphasize Sui Yuan's gorgeous figure. Coupled with red lips, rosy cheeks, and a face that can topple nations, he is as alluring as a male peacock flashing its tail feathers, attracting all members of the opposite sex. Only, that pale, delicate visage is void of all expression. 
Sui Yuan reaches out and tips the mirror on the table upwards. Immediately, slender eyebrows rise. Ink-black pupils rove lazily over the reflective surface as a faint, vague smile emerges. As those red lips curl further upwards, dimples appear. A slight tilt of his head has loose, black hair falling over a shoulder. Sui Yuan flicks his folding fan open, lightly waving it a few times. Then with a swish, the fan snaps shut again and he taps it thoughtfully on his lower lip. Such fine features, definitely belongs to an evil seducer who is able to topple nations? No, it should be an evil supporting male lead. System 5237 is stunned, flying around Sui Yuan in circles to admire its companion. Immediately, it feels very confident in its pick of partner this time, indeed worthy to be called a custom-made partner for it. Although he loses focus rather easily, the moment he enters a role, he molds himself to fit it splendidly. Any problems? An arrogant expression befitting an evildoer is plastered on Sui Yuan's face. Slightly narrowed, expressive eyes and languid drawl all come together to make him one appealing vixen-like character. Absolutely no problems 5237 says in a rather flamboyant tone, slightly too carried away with joy. Then let us depart. Sui Yuan nods his head, flicking his long sleeve lightly and pushing the door open. The scarlet red cloak draped over his shoulders billows out following his movements, then settles back on the floor in an orderly spread of fabric. These clothes are too long. It feels strange. Sui Yuan complains quietly. It can't be helped. One needs to be dressed more glamorously for their first trip outside. Bear with it and go out. System 5237 comforts as it floats in the air next to him. During the entire journey, the maidservants coming and going can't help but stare at Sui Yuan with a blush on their faces. Even a handful of men are captivated by him so much that they stare dazedly with mouths agape. But he simply holds his head high and turns a blind eye to them all, striding out of the mansion's gates and arriving at a busy market street. Here, he will have to take liberties with a young woman forced to prostitute herself in order to earn enough money for her father's burial. He will then be harshly reprimanded in the middle of the street by the female lead, who bravely steps forward and rescue the poor maiden from his clutches. At last, this closet M will fall for the female lead and use every kind of underhanded method to pursue her. Just like a six-year-old brat pulling the hair of a girl he likes in order to ensure she notices him. System 5237 drones on about this being a truly hackneyed storyline, but Sui Yuan doesn't feel anything regarding this cliché plot. As this is the first world he is experiencing, everything will naturally seem new and exciting. Men or women, young or old, all are left staring numbly as Sui Yuan breezes past. It is a pity the imposing aura he exudes dissuades one from thinking to go beyond staring and approach. As he walks, he examines the miscellaneous items being sold on the street with utmost interest. 5237 exhilaratingly informs him about the various items on display, including their value and use. It is determined to mark its companion's common sense that is still a piece of blank, white paper. Very quickly, a plum wood button and a small figurine are in Sui Yuan's hands. Although these items do not match the personality of his current role and seem rather out of place, 5237 can't find it in itself to refuse him as it stares at that pair of shining eyes. A while later, he finally arrives at the site where the plot is meant to take place. Sui Yuan glances down at the handful of items in his arms, then looks towards the pretty young girl wearing morning clothes and sobbing her heart out, suddenly feeling rather awkward. Who asked you to purchase so many things? System 5237 accuses, completely ignoring the fact that it didn't do its duty and forbid its partner from buying said things. What should we do? Throwing it all away is such a waste, a melancholic expression appears on Sui Yuan's face. How about finding someone to hold on to them for a while? 5237 proposes hesitantly. So annoying. Why does the plot want you to go out by yourself without bringing even a single bodyguard? So unreasonable. Because if there is a bodyguard around, the female lead would be beaten, Sui Yuan replies. System 5237. Sai, do you need help? A voice tinged with laughter suddenly comes from behind. Turning his head, Sui Yuan sees the very first person who dares approach him after coming to this world. You seem to be pretty troubled. Do you need to do something but is burdened by all the items in your arms? 
The handsome stranger who is clad in ordinary attire but exudes an imposing aura inquires with a faint smile, attitude extremely kind. I can help you hold it for a bit. Sui Yuan hesitates for a moment before coming to a decision. Dumping all the purchased goods into the stranger's arms, he throws out a word of thanks, then strides towards the young woman with the bearing of a man dead set on completing one's duty. System 5237, wait, hold on, fuck, this development is not right ah, Sui Yuan doesn't hear System 5237's heart-wrenching cry, nor does he see the tears of blood streaming down its face. For he has automatically entered character mode, the enchantingly evil aura wrapping around him like a cloak. A captivating smile on his face, he places his folded fan below the prostitute's chin, using it to tip the peasant girl's face up. Still not as attractive as me. In truth, Sui Yuan would like to avoid this little event, but no matter his innermost thoughts, he has a task to complete. Maintaining a faint smile on his face, his eyes narrow slightly and his head tilts a little to the side. Long, Pitch black hair flutters in the light breeze and brushes against the woman's cheek, causing her to flush red. Looking at you really incites pity in my heart. Since you are willing to sell yourself, how about selling to me? A slender finger extends to wipe the young girl's tears away. A sparkling teardrop falls onto the tip of his finger, truly resembling a shimmering gem upon white jade. If, if Darren assists this commoner to bury her father, this commoner will be willing to work like a horse or cattle for Darren. The woman chokes on her words as intense emotions surge forth. But, this commoner has already vowed to mother before she passed that I will never be anyone's concubine. I beseech Darren to allow me this request. Become a concubine. Sui Yuan scoffs coldly, tone full of contempt. Do you think you are fit to be a one? The young girl's pupils shrink in fear, disbelief bleeding onto her face. The terse silence stretches as she struggles to form an appropriate reply. I am Qin Wang. Women who are allowed into Qin Wang's residence, even if it is only to be a concubine, are at minimum daughters of lesser nobles. Sui Yuan smiles, his voice ambiguously affectionate, contrary to the frosty, cutting words falling from his lips. The only position you are fit to have is that of a concubine's maid. You have sold yourself to me. How I handle you is up to Bin Wang. A mere slave girl believing yourself to be as valuable as the purest jade? Really don't know how to differentiate good from bad. The woman's lips tremble faintly as tears begin to tumble down her cheeks. Please, please be magnanimous, Darren. This, this commoner does not wish to enter the prince's residence. Do you think you can refuse to enter just like that? Sui Yuan sneers. If I want you, who dares to say a single no? Not even a second after he says this, someone amongst the crowd yells aloud, I dare. Inwardly, Sui Yuan feels satisfaction course through his being as he praises himself for a magnificent performance. Languidly turning his head towards the direction of the voice, he stares wordlessly at the female lead pushing through the crowd for her hero saving the beauty scene. Such a great Qin Wang, bullying and humiliating a small, weak woman in the middle of the street, spouting such obscene words in public, beneath the foot of the rightful emperor, since when do you have the authority to disregard law or discipline? taking advantage of any commoner woman you see. Despite her petite figure, the female lead's commanding aura is definitely not feeble. However, her appearance left Sui Yuan feeling a tad disappointed. But according to 5237's knowledge, the recent trend for female leads is brain and personality over appearance. Any female who possesses great beauty is a cannon fodder. Sui Yuan quirks an eyebrow. Who are you? Speaking in this manner towards Bin Wang, such impertinence. This commoner is a record keeper in the Ministry of Justice, Fan Kao. The female lead greets Sui Yuan in a manner that is neither haughty nor humble. Immediately following her brief introduction, a myriad of laws and decrees flow from her mouth. Clever and witty, stately bearing attracting everyone's gaze, based on the plot, this female lead is a transmigrated soul who was a lawyer in her previous life. The onlookers standing in a circle begin to whisper to each other. Even if none dare openly oppose Sui Yuan, the surge of approval directed towards Fan Kao can be felt. With the public on her side, Fan Kao's words grow more stern and confident as she sees Sui Yuan's composure dwindle before her sound reasoning. Nonetheless, the blush of part fury, part shame that stains those pale cheeks pink and causes that beautiful visage to become more alluring affects her for a moment too. But she regains her composure swiftly. Count yourself lucky? Record keeper of the Ministry of Justice, Fan Kao, Bin Wang will remember you. 
Sui Yuan tosses down this ominous line, only for Fan Kao to fearlessly turn away in favor of supporting the frightened young girl. Softly comforting the sniffling woman, the female lead doesn't spare him a second glance. Lips thinning, he flings a sleeve in anger and strides off in the opposite direction. Hearing Sui Yuan depart, Fan Kao can't help glancing up at his retreating back. That dazzling view like a crimson rose in full bloom is deeply imprinted in her heart. Sui Yuan continues walking forward until he is sure he is out of the female lead's line of sight. Only then does he stop, glancing in all directions with irritation in his eyes. He has no idea if the stranger he entrusted his armful of goods to is still where he left him. But right now, Sui Yuan cannot go back to check as the female lead will be there, comforting the young girl and finding a place for her to stay. If that stranger decides not to wait and leaves with his items, then it will truly be a pity. Only after completing the task and returning to his usual frame of mind does Sui Yuan finally notice the downcast 5237. Head hanging dispiritedly, the plump system hovers in the air, seemingly about to self-destruct in despair. What happened? Sui Yuan asks in astonishment. 5237 lifts its head, eyes tearing. But before it can speak, another voice interrupts. There you are. You made me search quite a while. Whirling around on his heels, Sui Yuan is pleasantly surprised to see the stranger standing behind him with a bright smile on his face, arms still laden with various goods. You have my thanks, Sui Yuan says courteously as he takes back his purchased items from the man, forcibly restraining a bright smile from breaking out due to regaining what he thought was lost. No need to be so courteous. The stranger smiles, openly seizing up Sui Yuan. Clearly, he has seen how the latter oppressed a poor commoner for a complicated look enters his eyes as he makes no move to leave. Regarding interaction with people outside of the storyline, Sui Yuan finds it an extremely difficult task. Struggling to think of a polite way to bid farewell, his eyes drift towards 5237, seeking assistance. You must take careful note of this person, the system says helplessly. He is this world's male lead. I don't know why he suddenly appeared here as the both of you never interacted at this point of the story. You, do as you see fit. After listening to what 5237 has to say, Sui Yuan feels even more agitated. Muttering under his breath, he decides to continue acting. Only, he doesn't have any preset lines this time. To rely on himself to deal with this situation, he doesn't feel all that confident. The role of this world Sui Yuan is to act like a show-off in front of the female lead, enacting all sorts of despicable methods to win her over. An arrogant person with a sharp tongue but a soft heart. According to this persona, after being reprimanded by the female lead in public, he should be displaying a slightly lost attitude. You, saw what happened back there. Sui Yuan purses his lips, somewhat awkwardly tilting his head to the side, appearing for all the world like a pitiful puppy that suffered a kick under the male lead. I saw. Seeing Sui Yuan's head droop dejectedly, the male lead unexpectedly finds himself rendered speechless. Instead, he can only pat his, sy, head comfortingly. That woman was clearly brought up under the indulgence of her household. You shouldn't lower yourself to her level. Sui Yuan lifts his head, blinking in shock. This development is not right ah? How is the female lead a spoiled child? Shouldn't this label belong to Sui Yuan's character ah? Under this circumstance, shouldn't the male lead be berating him, leading to a battle of words between them? They should then part on bad terms and become official love rivals, right? Thus, Sui Yuan's gaze drifts towards 5237 again. However, this time, the system is valiantly pretending to be dead, completely ignoring his silent plea for help. Sui Yuan can only brace himself and struggle forward on his own. I will naturally not lower myself to her level. Sui Yuan straightens, nodding his head haughtily. She can be counted as a beauty and all beauties always have some sort of prerogative. The warm sunlight illuminates Sui Yuan's face, causing his appearance to seem even more like a beautiful painting. His arrogant, spoiled child manner only makes one feel like doting on him more rather than incite deep loathing. The perks of a supporting male lead ah. The male lead gazes intensely at Sui Yuan before slowly nodding. Indeed, all beauties have some kind of privilege. No matter what they do, People are willing to warp matters for them as long as it makes them happy. Successfully conveying his thoughts to the other party, Sui Yuan smiles in satisfaction. 
The blossoming smile coupled with dimples caused the stranger's eyes to brighten. Right hand dropping casually on Sui Yuan's right shoulder, he takes a few steps closer. May I know how to address you? Sui Yuan, Sui Yuan replies, smile still plastered on his face. Although the male lead and supporting male lead shouldn't meet yet in the storyline, letting the other party know his identity shouldn't be a major blunder. And he's Qin Wang, Sui Yuan, Qin Zhang, son of the first wife of Marquis Ding Yuan, General Fu Yuan, Qin Zhang. The identity and social status of the male lead and supporting male lead in this world is very different. One is General Fu Yuan, Qin Zhang, the son of Marquis Ding Yuan's first wife while the other is the good-for-nothing, second-generation prince, Qin Wang. The latter relies on the emperor for shelter, protection, and livelihood. All he needs to do every day is eat, drink and be merry. The former, however, is a military man who has waded through countless blood-soaked battlefields to earn his prestige. He is a young, revered, high-ranking official whom many greatly anticipate. When the plot commenced, Qin Zheng has just returned from another victorious battle. Upon returning to the capital, he meets the female lead, Fan Keiyeo, who is pure and elegant in appearance, but possesses a tough and unyielding personality. Therefore, the young general who is sick of seeing outwardly delicate but inwardly scheming noble ladies falls for this independent woman the moment he interacts with her. Through experiencing a series of ups and downs, the male and female lead's feelings for each other begins to grow. However, as a general, Qin Zheng is frequently sent to the frontiers, causing this pair to stay apart for long periods of time, meeting only once in a blue moon. In addition, due to Marquis Ding Yuan becoming more and more arrogant as his son continues to provide meritorious services to the nation, the emperor develops an increasing fear of this household's power. From time to time, the emperor will think of ways to grab this noble house by the pigtails one in order to regain control of the soldiers under the general's command. Alone in the capital, Fan Keiyeo strenuously works hard to help her absent husband defend their household by interacting with the emperor's relatives and court officials, crushing enemies and making connections. Sui Yuan, who was orphaned at a young age and became the prince who is most doted on by the emperor, proves to be an extremely big help to Fan Keiyeo. Putting in a good word about Marquis Ding Yuan's household before the emperor on her behalf, using his name and reputation as a guarantee, and so on. A pity that even he is incapable of completely preventing the emperor's plan to revoke Qin Zheng's military leadership from occurring, merely succeeding in delaying it. Naturally, both the Marquis and Qin Zheng are aware of the emperor's schemes. In order to ensure the safety and security of their household but unwilling to renounce the glory and wealth they have accumulated, they ultimately decide to revolt. In the capital, Sui Yuan and Fan Keiyeo collaborate to give them ample preparation time. When everything is prepared accordingly, Fan Keiyeo gathers the females of the Marquis household together, pretending to have planned a trip up the mountains in order to pray for blessings. Instead, they secretly flee the capital that night. Sui Yuan is left in the dark and is still in the capital when Marquis Ding Yuan's plan to revolt is exposed. Mad with fury, the emperor orders Sui Yuan, who is always seen in the company of the Marquis people, to be thrown in jail. However, the lifelong affections he has for this child lingers, making him believe that Sui Yuan is merely blinded by love. In the end, the emperor spares his life, only taking away his title. Personally leading his army, Qin Zheng invades the capital. During this time, Marquis Ding Yuan is critically wounded, eventually falling ill and died. With the support of the entire nation's army, Qin Zheng seizes the throne and becomes emperor, with Fan Keiyeo as his empress. Feeling guilty for keeping Sui Yuan in the dark regarding the latter part of their plans, the female lead urges Qin Zheng to reinstate him as Qin Wang, ensuring him a lifetime of protection. Only, Sui Yuan's heart is already shattered. Unable to face his old love who had a hand in killing his family, furious at himself for becoming an unknown accomplice in this murder, he quietly leaves the capital to roam free over the mountains and across rivers, seeking to heal his soul. Forsaking riches and honor for a lifetime of loneliness in the wilderness, the plot of this world ought to develop in this direction. According to 5237's words, besides that final, miserable period in prison, he will be drowning in riches and prestige. Regarding this storyline, Sui Yuan reckons he is pretty satisfied with it. A shame that the recent development seems a little odd somehow, what are you thinking about? 
Qin Zhang smiles lightly as he reaches down to grasp Sui Yuan's right hand, pressing it more firmly against the bow in the latter's palms. The scorching touch of the male lead's bare skin is enough to pull the musing Sui Yuan out of his thoughts. Glancing up uneasily, he finally notices Qin Zhang's face is extremely close. Not only that, the two are currently in a rather ambiguous position, with him half drawn into Qin Zhang's arms. Doesn't this position seem not quite right? Sui Yuan silently inquires in his heart. System 5237 instantly curses as it gives him a withering reply. Your mom? Of course it is not right. It's absolutely wrong. This is a BG world, not a BL one ah. Sui Yuan. You are always so absent-minded, Qin Zheng says, tone somewhat resentful as his arms tighten. Pulling Sui Yuan fully into his embrace, his lips almost brush against the helix of a delicate ear. Who was it who said they wished to learn archery? My hand hurts a little, Sui Yuan states truthfully. Qin Zheng frowns, reaching down to grab his left hand. Prying Lu Sui Yuan's fingers to inspect his palm, one can see faint cuts marring the once flawless and tender skin. Immediately, Qin Zheng's eyes narrow as he chides, why didn't you say so earlier? Seizing this opportunity, Sui Yuan escapes the male lead's arms and shakes his head slightly. With great effort, he draws his carefully crafted personality together. What you can do, Bin Wang can also accomplish. Bin Wang doesn't need to be coddled. You, Qin Zheng doesn't know whether to laugh or to cry. In the end, he simply drags Sui Yuan over to the side and carefully applies some salve on the cuts. I have been practicing since I was young, so my skin is rough and calloused. But you are a noble Qin Wang, why should you lower yourself to compare with me? A single bite is not enough to fatten anyone. In order to improve, one will need to take a single step at a time. Pondering for a moment, Sui Yuan feels that what he said makes sense. Like a cat reluctantly following instructions, he raises his chin and narrows his eyes haughtily, giving an aloof nod. Qin Zheng can't help but laugh, settling himself down on the wall next to Sui Yuan. Scrutinizing the attractive and intelligent face for a moment, he opens his mouth again. Tomorrow, a feast will be held in the Marquis residence. Many noble ladies from the capital will be present. Would you, like to participate? Blinking, Sui Yuan's head tips slightly to the side in question. Will, she be there too? So far, besides his usual routine of eating, drinking, playing and appointments with Qin Zheng, he hasn't slacked in keeping an eye on the female lead. He would appear in places she frequents, visit stalls and tea houses on a whim and even had someone follow her around, all just to impress his existence in her mind. Naturally, the Qin Zheng who has come to shadow him knows his thoughts regarding Fan Kao. Therefore, just a single her is enough for both parties to understand. Yes, of course, she will be there. Qin Zheng nods. Then I will go too. Sui Yuan declares as he shoots to his feet. Restlessly pacing in a circle, he takes out his folding fan and flicks it open, smoothly transitioning into someone who is secretly in love with another. Say, what do you think I ought to wear tomorrow? No, the clothes I have are all old. I will send someone to fetch a seamstress and make a few new sets. Stop shouting. Qin Zheng snaps sullenly as he grabs hold of the pacing Sui Yuan. It's a feast meant for me to choose a suitable spouse. Are you trying to steal my stage? So what if I do steal it? You can't measure up to me. Sui Yuan sniffs arrogantly. Yes, yes, yes. I can't compare with you. Therefore, even if you wear your daily attire, you will still outshine all the blossoming flowers there. Qin Zheng placates with a smile. I don't think you can use blossoming flowers in this context. Sui Yuan points out after a brief pause. Qin Zheng waves it away with a vague laugh before a sigh causes his smile to vanish, replaced by a serious expression. You are right. I made a mistake. The correct phrase should be elegant and distinguished, with a peerless, refined appearance. Sui Yuan. After displaying the appropriate amount of adoration for the female lead, he allows himself to be appeased by Qin Zheng. After all, this banquet is a vital development point between the male and female lead where the both of them get to know more about each other. As the supporting male lead, he had better not upset the apple cart and quietly do his duty. The next day, Sui Yuan enters the marquee residence at Qin Zheng's invitation. In order to allow the male lead to display his charisma and valiant disposition, Sui Yuan deliberately chooses to wear a bland green robe. Although it lacks splendor, it is elegant in its simplicity and gives the wearer a subtly refined air. Standing next to the well-built general, 
the pair contrast greatly, one of delicate sophistication and the other of striking dominance. Chatting and laughing, the two men enter the residence's inner courtyard together. Here, the hostess converses with a few noble ladies as other guests gather in smaller groups, sitting or standing. Some carry a dignified aura while others bear a more flirtatious air. After he greets the host, Sui Yuan ignores everything else, gaze glued onto Fan Kao. As soon as the female lead appears, he shifts seamlessly into character. Aloof manner, egoistic gleam in his eyes, an arrogant aura that oozes unwillingness to approach first. Even 5,237 cannot help but give a like. Confronting Fan Kao is a task he takes to like a fish to water. After all, his main mission is to pursue the female lead. That time, when he unwittingly bumped into the male lead and made a mess of things, it was because he had no set script to follow. Scripted scenes are a breeze. Unfolding his fan with a snap, Sui Yuan's phoenix eyes narrows the slightest bit, subtle affection bleeding into his alluring smile. Emotions swirl in those dark pupils as though the owner is trying to convey a touching speech with a mere glance. The aura emitting from this enticing figure causes one to fear going near, but at the same time, cannot resist being drawn in. Intimidated by the arrogant air, the noble ladies shrink away, approaching Fan Kao with an attitude that clearly indicates his desire to be closer but still unbearably haughty. They once again reach a point of disagreement in a mere two or three sentences. Reduced to complete silence by Fan Kao's clever and eloquent way with words, Sui Yuan eventually cuts their interaction short with an annoyed snort and a flick of his sleeves, thus ending this banquet scene. Afterwards, he has to wait until both the male and female leads are adequately occupied with each other, before taking the opportunity to bid the hosts goodbye and slip out. Murmuring plans under his breath, Sui Yuan stands near the edge of the pond, absently watching the swaying lotuses. Turning his head away, he finally notices Qin Zheng standing behind and off to the side, a smile on his face. What are you doing here? Still not going to mingle and see if there's a suitable lady. Looking at this male lead, Sui Yuan can't help worrying on his behalf. You are a guest. Furthermore, you are a guest I invited. How can I carelessly toss you aside, leaving you to roam the grounds all alone? My mother will naturally take good care of those women, Qin Zheng says with an easy smile, lifting a hand to smooth the frown creasing Sui Yuan's brow having a hard time dealing with her. Pff. Sui Yuan turns his head away. She is irritating to the point of death. This kind of woman will definitely not be able to marry. That's why you pity her and plan to take responsibility. Qin Jing gives a playful wink. What? What take responsibility? Sui Yuan scowls. As if I'm willing. Right, right, you are definitely unwilling. The other man agrees as though soothing a small child. Falling silent, Sui Yuan stares at 5,237. He really doesn't understand why this brother is avoiding such a good woman, instead encouraging him in his pursuit. What's the matter, aren't they meant to be love rivals? 5,237 simply rolls back and forth on the ground, like a round little ball with limbs, an expression of can't bear to witness on its face. Fan Kao, what do you think of her? Sensing this development is not quite right. Sui Yuan mentally braces himself as asks. She is a good woman, strong, upright, courageous, and intelligent, Qin Zheng answers promptly, tone serious. Although her status is a little low and can't be the princess consort, she can still be a concubine. Or you can always implore the emperor. He dotes on you so much. Can't say for sure that he might agree. This answer is completely beyond Sui Yuan's expectations, causing his head to ache. Don't you fancy her? One must not cover a friend's wife. Qin Zheng frowns in displeasure. Since you harbor affections for her in your heart, I will naturally not steal her away. Or in your eyes, am I the sort of scoundrel who will make a move on his friend's sweetheart? Sui Yuan remains silent, choking on distress and a range of negative emotions. Equally distraught, System 5237 circles Sui Yuan's head once before leaning in to rub against his body. The male lead is an upstanding individual. Since the supporting male lead has become close friends with the male lead, he has set up a clear boundary line between the female lead and himself, as his friend clearly desires her. This mission, you've already failed half of it. Sui Yuan, what about the other half? 5237, protect the male lead, ensure his revolt succeeds and he is crowned emperor. Sui Yuan, 
so it seems I cannot avoid imprisonment either way. In order to meet the standards of a good supporting male lead, in order to salvage the remaining half of the mission he has yet to fail at, Sui Yuan puts in all his hard work and effort into every task. Exhausting a lot of time and effort, he strives to create events and openings where the male and female lead would be able to meet by chance. Only, it is a shame that each time he catches sight of the female lead, he will automatically slip into character, adopting an arrogant manner. On the other hand, Qin Zheng is as upright a man as can be, refusing to give his friend's wife more than a passing glance even if his life is at stake. Instead, Qin Zheng eagerly offers Sui Yuan advice on how best to capture a beauty, causing Sui Yuan untold amounts of hardship. During this mission, Sui Yuan learns a rather important lesson. If the male lead is this kind of upright gentleman, then he must absolutely not show interest in the female lead before him. Or else, it will be impossible to ensure the story follows the original plot. Without Fan Kao as the predestined female lead, Qin Zheng naturally doesn't show a sliver of interest in the other delicate noble ladies. Not long after the banquet that failed in rousing Qin Zheng's interest in a woman, a relaxed male lead returns to shadowing Sui Yuan. The pair roams the streets, go hunting, reading scrolls, and generally spend most of their free time together. And naturally, the most important thing is to try steering him in the direction of the female lead. As a standard supporting male lead, the female lead is like a flower reflecting upon the water's surface. One can desire after her but cannot gain her. Even if everyone in his vicinity knows he harbors feelings for the female lead, even if there isn't this remarkable specimen of a male lead, even if the female lead somehow reciprocates his feelings, Sui Yuan can only persevere with his excuse in the form of a haughty remark, as if I will like such a boorish woman. This constant statement really makes one's hair stand up in anger ah, but who can understand the distress deep in his heart? Regarding Sui Yuan failing half of his mission in his very first world, 5237 can only offer him comfort, encouraging him to struggle to the bitter end, as well as let the male and female leads do whatever they want. After all, being a constant companion to the male lead is pretty difficult in itself. Although this diligent supporting male lead did unwittingly tear the plot apart, seeing the self-blame on Sui Yuan's face, it really can't bear to berate him. 5237 is also feeling extremely vexed. With the gradual passage of time, the period originally meant for the male and female lead to meet, get to know each other and eventually marry is thus passed with Sui Yuan and Qin Zheng spending almost every day together. The nomadic tribes in the northwest invade the borders once more, and Qin Zheng is called back to lead his army. In the 10,000 Miles Pavilion, Sui Yuan is there to bid him farewell. 5,237 circles around his head, sorrowfully chanting this scene belongs to the female lead ah. the rest is drowned out by the soft strum of instruments in the background. Here we part, not knowing when we shall meet again. Qin Zheng gaze locks on Sui Yuan's face, deep and intense as he slowly lifts a hand to stroke down his long hair. Play a song to bid me farewell, what do you say? Sui Yuan regards him silently, before nodding his head wordlessly. An attendant standing a respectful distance away comes forward with a zither and a stand, setting them down in the middle of the pavilion. As soon as the attendant retreats, Sui Yuan settles himself comfortably before the instrument. Scarlet robes pooling gracefully around his person, he resembles a rose in full bloom. Slender hands stroking the strings lightly, his long eyelashes lower, half masking his shining, dark pupils. In his heart, he questions 5237 on the song ought to be played during this scene. According to the original development, the female lead will play a revised and modified version of an ancient song Kui Yingying plays during her separation with Zhang Sheng. However, before 5237 can finish speaking, Sui Yuan has already started plucking at the strings. Within the soaring tune, one can clearly feel the resentment and agony pouring out from the depths of a person's heart as they are forced to part with their lover. Silently, the system turns its head away, muttering under its breath, however, it is a song of farewell between a pair of lovers or husband and wife. Between you and Qin Zheng, this song isn't appropriate. The words are garbled thanks to the tears of blood streaming down its cheeks. This day would be impossible to pass? Qin Zheng stares at Sui Yuan with half-lidded eyes as the latter lowers his head, playing the zither with a single-minded focus. A trace of melancholy surfaces in the once calm and tranquil gaze. Walking slowly over so he is standing behind Sui Yuan, 
He drops down to one knee and embraces the other man. Sui Yuan jerks lightly in surprise, causing his fingers to slip and strum a few wrong notes. However, being a dedicated person, he swiftly recovers his serenity. Not turning his head back to look and not saying a single word, he merely concentrates on playing the song. Qin Zheng's embrace is warm and forceful. Burying his head in the curve of Sui Yuan's neck, he inhales deeply. The hot breath of his exhale causes Sui Yuan to feel a little awkward, and he can't help the reddening of his ear. Qin Zheng's eyelids slide close as he tilts his head a little, leaving a soft kiss behind on Sui Yuan's neck. Whispering a single word of precious in Sui Yuan's ear, Qin Zheng abruptly stands. Striding swiftly away and down the short flight of stairs, he comes to a stop before his snow-white warhorse. The warriors in his army are all already mounted and prepared, waiting for a signal from their general. Mounting his horse in one smooth motion, the white steed whinnies and kicks its front hooves in the air. A nudge with his heel has the horse galloping away. From start to end, he doesn't glance back even once, doesn't turn to gaze at the straight-backed, serene-looking man pouring his heart out into playing this emotional farewell song. Following Qin Zheng's action, the rest of the cavalry kicks into action, urging their own horses forward to catch up. Ten miles away from the pavilion, one can still hear the swirling myriad of emotions in the faint strums of the zither's strings. The hidden bitterness, the deep sorrow, the tender adoration, and the painful yearning. Thud, thud, as the sound of horse hooves striking the ground gradually fades into the distance, the song comes to an end, causing silence to fall once more in the 10,000 miles pavilion. Finally lifting his head, he gazes absently in the direction Qin Zheng departed, only to return to reality at the sound of soft sobbing coming from behind him. Sui Yuan glances over his shoulder somewhat blankly to see his two personal maids covering their mouths with their sleeves and weeping endlessly. Their clear, bright eyes are now filled with pitying sympathy for him. In addition, all his male attendants bear red eyes too. Waves of sorrow seem to pour out of everyone present, as though they are the ones bidding their family members farewell. Why are you crying? Sui Yuan asks as he rises gracefully to his feet, figure straight and aloof as usual. It's just that without Qin Zheng, Fan Keiyeo, and all the important characters here, he doesn't feel like playing his role. Hence, he currently looks somewhat stupefied, as though valiantly trying to persevere through the pain of separation. General Qin will definitely return. He will return safe and sound. That's why, please take care of yourself, one of the maids forces out through her tears softly consoling her distraught master. The other promptly drapes a cloak around his shoulders, seemingly afraid that his grief will cause damage to his body, and he will not be able to endure the cool autumn wind. Sui Yuan remains silent. Although he roughly understands why they are afraid he will become distressed by Qin Zheng's departure, what he cannot comprehend is the fact that they are so emotional over a small matter. Fortunately, Sui Yuan is not a curious person by nature. When faced with something he cannot make sense of, he is too lazy to inquire. Thus, he merely nods. Naturally, he called me precious, after all. These words cause the two maids' emotions to spill over once more, hot tears welling up in their eyes. After seeing off this male lead, Sui Yuan's life returns to his usual routine of eating, drinking, and making merry. Only, he doesn't wish to deepen his relationship with the female lead too far. It might unexpectedly cause the supporting male lead to end up with the woman, and such a thing will surely result in a poor evaluation. Hence, he lessens his interaction with her to prevent anything from developing. A year later, the parents of the female record keeper in the Ministry of Justice, Fan Keiyeo, found a matchmaker and engaged her to the Minister of Rights' first wife's son. As both families are well matched in terms of social status, neither party opposed this marriage. Before the date of marriage, Fan Keiyeo follows her mother to the temple in order to burn incense and pray for a blissful marriage and harmonious relationship. Coincidentally, they bump into Sui Yuan who is currently savoring the various vegetarian dishes in the inner courtyard of the temple. Beneath the blossoming peach trees, a crimson-robed Sui Yuan lies languidly in its shade. Compared to the gorgeous blooms of the trees, this man is a hundredfold more captivating, so much so that the scene before her all but dazzles Fan Keiyeo's eyes. I didn't expect to meet you in a place like this, Fan Keiyeo states with a small smile, tone distracted. Sui Yuan remains taciturn, struggling to restrain the urge to slip into his arrogant persona in front of the female lead. On top of that, he is at a loss for what to say under this kind of circumstances.
Even if there is originally a scene of the two of them running into each other in the inner courtyard of the temple before the female lead's marriage to the male lead, none of the lines would be appropriate right now. Ah, uh, already not feeling like talking to me? Have you come to realize that the most beloved person in your heart is actually not me? Fan Kao chuckles lightly as she shakes her head. You are uh, still so haughty. Be careful this attitude of yours, or else you would only push your true love far away. Sui Yuan can only stare wordlessly at this, for he can't seem to keep up with the female lead's train of thought. Seeing as we are friends, I will give you my blessings. Fan Kao inclines her head briefly, warm encouragement in her eyes. Although this path is a difficult one, for a lot of people are unwilling to accept it in this era, it will be hard to be accepted even several hundred years later. I still wish that the both of you are able to obtain happiness. Sui Yuan's mouth opens, then closes again. While he might not be able to fathom her thoughts, he still realizes that the other has given him her blessings. Since that's the case, then the appropriate response should be expressing one's gratitude, right? Pursing his lips for a moment, Sui Yuan eventually nods his head lightly. Many thanks. A soft smile breaks out on Fan Kao's face before she waves at him and takes her leave. Staring at her departing back, Sui Yuan's gaze becomes blank, as though recalling something in the past. Many leagues away, at the northwestern border, Qin Zheng takes the report from the capital handed to him by an attendant with a slight frown. Upon the folded paper, four words on He Qin Wang can be seen. The record keeper in the Ministry of Justice, Fan Keiyeo, has been engaged to the son of the Minister of Rights, Li Maja. On the 27th of March, she met with Qin Wang in the inner courtyard of Guan Yuan Temple. From an He Qin Wang's sparse words, it is clear that he retains his regards towards you hard-pressed to forget. General Fuyuan, Qin Zheng, managed to deal a huge blow to the enemy, breaking their troops' morale and forcing them back. His remarkable reputation once again resonates throughout the country with this victory. Moreover, with the army that numbers more than 10,000 under Marquis Ding Yuan's command, they successfully dissuade other foreign invaders from trying their luck. While the worries in the emperor's heart is appeased, doubts also begin to rise. Strangle the rabbit. Cook the hunting dog. Clip the wings of the falcon. Break the prized bow. These words are the one and only admonition feared by generals in the ancient era. But it often comes true. Rare are those who are allowed to live the rest of their lives safe and sound after riding numerous waves of victory and bringing glory to their household. As such, the emperor begins to subtly hint for the civilian court officials to give trouble to Marquis Ding Yuan. Hence, soon after news of their resounding victory, the Marquis residence receives news of rough times ahead. The current emperor is not a muddle-headed individual, but he is too impatient. Despite the heavy protests, he only cares about swiftly enacting a plan to regain the military command seal from the Marquis household and oppress their rising power. In order to ensure he doesn't fail the entire mission, Sui Yuan decides that what he really needs to do now is to follow the storyline assist Qin Zheng and his people down the path of revolt and to protect the women, children, and elders within the Marquis residence. The Anhe Qin Wang who has always refrained from entering court politics begins to frequent the palace and the residences of important ministers. For the first time in his life, he reveals his outstanding talent for politics that is as incredible as his outward appearance. Every smile, every frown, and every move from him can touch a person's heart. No matter what he says, as long as he backs it up with sound reasoning, none would be capable of objecting. Gradually, the Marquis and others following him begin to gather at Sui Yuan's side. With him sheltering them, redirecting the Emperor's ire and helping to shoulder the unofficial crime placed on their heads, they manage to significantly delay the Emperor's plans. Sui Yuan continues holding firmly onto the principle of virtues and morals, using them to tactfully persuade the Emperor that he must not act with haste. Revoking a household's military power requires detailed step-by-step -step planning, and one must definitely not harm old generals who are patriotic and utterly loyal, who shed blood and sacrificed so much in defense of this nation. All you have said, Zhen Wen understands, however, can one sleep soundly on a narrow bed? One day of the seal remaining out of my hands is another day Zhen cannot have a peaceful rest up. The emperor who is more than half a century old sighs with sorrow and regret as he reaches out to stroke Sui Yuan's long hair in comfort. Dressed in a crimson and gold robe that enhances his alluring visage, Sui Yuan gazes at the sovereign with worry in his eyes. Gently, with a voice full of reassurance, he says, I understand, 
Your Majesty. However, I am unwilling to continue listening to people denouncing you. Marquis Ding Yuan's household has always been loyal and faithful. Ever since the founding of the state, they have been valiantly guarding the border, shedding blood, sweat, and tears for generations. Fighting against the enemy and defending the country. Let's give them some time, I believe they will surely understand your difficult position and will hand over the command seal. Looking at the child he personally raised from childhood, the emperor belatedly realized that the adorable, jade-like baby has already grown into a fine young man that all the more incites the urge to pamper him in people's hearts. He simply cannot find it in himself to refuse this child. Heaving a soft sigh, he recalls the heavy resistance in the court and eventually concedes with a nod. Perhaps you are right. Zhen acted with undue haste. Then, let's take our time. We shall first recall Marquis Ding Yuan father and son back to the capital before planning our next move. A radiant smile breaks out on Sui Yuan's face. Your majesty is wise. Emerging from the imperial study, he makes a detour to pay a visit to the empress as well as several favored imperial concubines. Having lost his parents at the age of eight, he has frequent the palace since childhood. It is appropriate to say that he was partially brought up at the knees of select imperial concubines. While they are not related by blood, there still exists between them affection akin to mother and son. If Sui Yuan so wishes, with a few honeyed words, he can steal the affections of these imperial concubines, making their hearts flutter to the point of promising to sway the emperor through pillow talk, thus sealing their guarantee to help defend the Marquis household. Court officials, the emperor, and the favored imperial concubines. With a few smiles and waves of his long sleeves, he has them all dancing in his palm. However, no one questions as to why he is suddenly doing things he doesn't normally do to help Marquis Ding Yuan and their people, for the deep friendship between Qin Wang and General Fu Yuan is known to all. Coming out of the palace, Sui Yuan immediately heads for the Marquis residence. The old madam disregards her aging and ill body, coming out to receive him personally. Clasping his hands in her own wrinkled ones, tears roll down her cheeks. Never did I expect that you will be the savior of our household. This old madam really doesn't know how to express my thanks, the old madam's hands tremble. Should, should our residents pass this difficult period and emerge safe and sound, then you will be a huge benefactor to us. If there is a chance, this old madam hopes that I will be able to hear you call mother. Sui Yuan stiffens as he studies the old lady's hopeful gaze. Based on her attitude, she seems to truly desire this, hence he calls her mother once. The old madam freezes for a split second, then turns tears into laughter. Drawing him into her embrace, she replies with a silly child, sounding more doting towards him than her own children. Her attitude is very strange. When I came here before, she was neither cold nor warm. Sui Yuan complains to 5,237 silently. He is really not accustomed to being so intimate with people. This old madam is very astute. 5,237 scoffs. The last time you were here, she was afraid you would steal away her most promising and profitable son. Now, her entire household can only rely on you for help so she will naturally be sweet to you. That way, even if you throw away your life just to save them, you wouldn't regret doing so. So it's like this. Having received a lecture from the system, Sui Yuan understands the situation now but he remains exceptionally calm and undisturbed. Sure enough, there are still a lot of things I need to learn. 5237 can't you at least show me a little disappointment or any other normal reactions? Making small, emotional talk with the old madam, Sui Yuan finally shifts the topic to a more serious matter. He wants to follow the plot, which means sneaking every member of the Marquis residence out of the capital. The entire foolproof plan has already been thought out, so all he needs to do is follow it word for word. Listening to Sui Yuan's plan, the old madam's eyes widen in astonishment. Never did she expect to see the day she is able to leave the capital. This news moves her so much that she all but faints. With such a rare opportunity dangling before her, the old madam will naturally not let it go. Restraining her emotions, she begins to discuss the plan in detail with Sui Yuan, ensuring everything will be arranged on time and in order. Making a prompt decision, she approves the enactment of this plan on behalf of her household. Along with the emperor retracting his wish to revoke the Marquis military leadership, relations between the royal family and the Marquis residence gradually smooths over again. Having gotten information from Sui Yuan a while ago, 
Marquis Dingyuan receives the imperial edict to return to the capital without hesitation. At the same time, he also sends a reply saying he will comply with the emperor's wish and hand over the command seal as soon as he returns. The emperor is ecstatic as soon as he hears this, generously bestowing rewards on the marquis as well as guaranteeing the safety of everyone in the household. He also withdraws all the spies he has around the marquis residence. News of Marquis Dingyuan father and son returning from the front lines with only a small portion of their soldiers travel quickly throughout the country. As a result, the hostile, nomadic tribes that were oppressed by General Fuyuan begins to rally once more and set an ambush. The father and son pair, as well as their small routine of bodyguards, became unaccounted for. Hearing this bad news, the old madam falls gravely ill. However, she persists in wanting to make the trip up to the temple within the mountains in order to pray for her husband and son's safe return. The emperor cannot possibly deny her this, but sends the Yu Lin army to protect the women folk during their journey. However, another piece of information arrives in the palace soon after. The procession was attacked and the well-disciplined, experienced soldiers of the Yu Lin army were beaten into a very sorry state. All traces of the Marquis family members vanished in the aftermath of the attack apparently being murdered by their attackers. But deep down, everyone is aware that they are still alive. They've merely succeeded in fleeing the capital. The emperor explodes in fury, ordering this matter be thoroughly investigated. However, before they can even begin to scratch the surface of it, the previously missing Marquis Dingyuan father and son apparently reappeared safe and sound, accompanied by their army which numbers in the tens of thousands. In the capital, having received news of the plan succeeding, Sui Yuan straightens his clothes, mentally preparing himself to welcome the sole momentous point his character faces in the story. Face void of all expression, he wordlessly steps out the doors of his room to meet the soldiers sent by the emperor to detain him. Such an elegant and graceful prince bearing a dull and blank gaze. Surely, there is nothing sadder than beholding a person with a shattered heart. The soldiers escorting Qin Wang can't bring themselves to take more than a glance. Their hearts wouldn't be able to bear the pain. Walking out of his residence with head held high, his bearing remains confident and unflinching. Not the least bit cowed, he doesn't resemble a criminal being escorted to prison and awaiting interrogation, but rather, it seems as though he is merely bringing a few bodyguards out for a walk through the streets. By word of mouth, the homosexual man who did everything for love spreads throughout the capital and later, the nation. Like most ancient stories, this one too, is filled with heartbreak and ends in sorrow. A jade-like prince with the gracefulness and allure of an immortal renounced everything in order to protect the household of the young general Qin Zheng, but is ultimately met with a dark and tragic end when the person in his heart abandoned him for the throne. In those days long ago, the two were close as brothers, confiding in each other and withholding no secrets. Now, due to obtaining the mantle of emperor, one pushes the other onto the execution ground. A single, merciless strike to severe all past feelings and affection. On the road, Sui Yuan notices Fan Kao standing amongst the crowd, hands over her mouth and weeping endlessly. By her side, her husband stands, unable to placate the grievances in her heart. The only thing he can offer is tender love, concern, and physical support. Tears overflowing with no end in sight, Fan Kao locks gaze with Sui Yuan for as long as possible. In her heart, under the disbelief, pity, and sympathy for Sui Yuan surge forth while deep resentment and disdain for Qin Zheng rages. Sui Yuan's step pauses for a moment to shoot a soft, faint smile in her direction. That second long, gorgeous smile leaves a deep impression on everyone present. Tranquil. Serene. Without a trace of hatred or regret. Perhaps, for the rest of their lives, they will never again witness this unrivaled, strong, and moving prince. Within the command tent of the rebel army stationed in the northwest, Qin Zheng clutches a secret report in one hand, head hanging low as his other hand covers his eyes. If one is to accomplish big matters, one should not bother with trifles. There will inevitably be sacrifices along the way. Reaching out to pat his beloved son comfortingly on the shoulder, Marquis Dingyuan heaves a long, heavy sigh as he feels the always firm and unyielding man shudder faintly. A long while later, when he is all alone, an ironic, humorless smile curves Qin Zheng's lips as a weary, gloomy look surfaces in his eyes. For Sui Yuan, his experience in prison is something he is reluctant to ever think about again. Although he has System 5237 by his side to provide mental strength and encouragement, 
it is still far from enough to help him cope with his current situation. After all, the story did not focus on the hardship the supporting male lead endured during his period of imprisonment, merely skating around it. The most emphasis is placed on describing the lives of the male and female leads. Hence, Sui Yuan can only endure this experience day after day, not knowing what is in store. Moreover, in the original plot, Fan Kao was the mastermind behind the entire operation, while the ignorant Sui Yuan was merely used to make everything go smoothly. This time, the one who planned and handled everything is Sui Yuan himself. Therefore, his crime is many times greater, and the punishment for it will be many times heavier. Under Qin Zheng's command, the rebel army slices through the emperor's soldiers like a hot knife through butter. Very quickly, more than half the country falls under their control. When the present emperor eventually visits the prison, the originally healthy man in both spirit and mind has undergone a huge change, his age showing in every crease of his face. Sui Yuan's appearance is also not much better. The originally gorgeous crimson robes have long become dull with dirt and grime. The waist length, silky hair tangled together, forming messy braids. Being placed in such a difficult situation, it is no wonder he has lost a lot of weight. However, he still retains his usual flower-like, alluring visage. Those dark phoenix eyes are no longer bright, gaze becoming cold and indifferent. One can even say empty or soulless. The emperor's throat trembles faintly as he chokes on his surging emotions. That day when he heard the truth about the situation, he had been so furious he thought about striking the prince down. In the end, his heart won out, rendering him incapable of such an act. After all, when all is said and done, he nurtured this child from childhood, watching him grow and mature. In the emperor's eyes, Sui Yuan is a naive and innocent soul still unversed in worldly matters. Blinded by love, made use of by others. Do you regret? The emperor's voice is old but no less forceful. Sui Yuan shakes his head wordlessly. In order to complete his task, he is naturally not remorseful. No regrets. The emperor repeats. Your love for him remains bone deep. While Sui Yuan doesn't quite understand the meaning behind the emperor's words, he merely keeps silent and shakes his head again. No matter who the emperor is referring to, he definitely doesn't harbor a bone-deep love for anyone. Who exactly is he talking about? Being wrongly accused of having a lover, Sui Yuan feels he must investigate this matter. Hence, he directs this questions to 5237. It's Qin Zheng. 5237 replies helplessly even as it gnashes its teeth in annoyance. A good old BG world is unexpectedly transformed into a BL1. You're really capable. Sui Yuan becomes gloomy. He feels he really is innocent ah? Uh? He followed the script accordingly and put as much effort as possible into being the best supporting male lead? Haha, <laughs> indeed, one should not love him? Absolutely cannot ah? Uh? The emperor laughs bitterly. Lifting a hand to stroke Sui Yuan's head in reminisce of the past, he continues, Zhen doesn't wish to kill you, but I also cannot let you go free, do you understand? Sui Yuan obediently nods his head. While he does regret not being able to walk free as a commoner, he can only accept it after changing so many things in the plot. As the main offender, he doesn't expect anything more. Zhen will keep you locked in here. If Zhen succeeds in putting down the revolt, you will die together with him. Be companions on your journey to the Yellow Springs. Who can say that you might meet again in the next world? When that time comes, do not be as feeble-minded as you were in this life, being used and thrown aside. The emperor falls silent for a moment, then exhales heavily. If Zhen is defeated, then wait here for Qin Zheng to free you. Thank you for your benevolence. Sui Yuan's blank expression finally relaxes. He can feel relieved now in mind and heart. System 5237 has guaranteed he will not be destroyed even if he dies in this world, that as long as the mission is completed, he will simply receive his rewards and immediately travel to the next world. But the feeling of dying is, of course, nothing good. Sui Yuan also doesn't wish to think about it. After the emperor leaves, silence falls in the prison once more. Occasionally, Sui Yuan can hear the jailers discussing about the revolt, and whether or not the rebels have made headway. But as one day bleeds into another, he has long since lost count of how many days he has stayed in this tiny cell. Inevitably, the calm and collected him begin to feel impatient and anxious. How he wishes for a fast-forward button he can use that will take him straight to the end of the story. 
This feeling is akin to being cut to pieces with a blunt knife. Naturally, Sui Yuan doesn't waste his time in prison staring at the wall. In order to pass the time quickly, he learns a lot of essential knowledge from the system so he would be better equipped in dealing with unexpected circumstances in different worlds. On this particular day, he has just started making a crack at a language called English when hurried footsteps ring out, as though someone is urgently running along the corridors of the prison. A few seconds later, the cell door opens with an ear-piercing creak. Sui Yuan raises his head at the sound only to see Qin Zhang still clad in his full-body armor stained with speckles of blood. He blinks, wanting to display his customary haughty smile, but that urge is instantly dashed when he recalls where the plot is currently at right now. Un, his scene has already come to an end. The only thing that remains is to bid the capital farewell, renounce everything and become a wanderer traveling across the lands. On top of that, according to the established plot, Qin Zheng and him can be considered completely inharmonious now. Even without the female lead bringing about the rivalry for her love, there is still Sui Yuan's hatred for Qin Zheng after the latter seizes the throne and puts his family to death. Moreover, with Fan Keiyao happily married to someone else, Sui Yuan doesn't have the conflicting feeling of love and hate for anyone. Fundamentally, only hatred exists. Thus, as soon as he determines what he should be feeling and doing, Sui Yuan slips into character, entering acting mode. The vacant look in his eyes, when he was deep in contemplation, is abruptly replaced by deep resentment. A pleasant smile on his face, Qin Zheng is about to step into the cell when he is stopped dead by the ice-cold glint in Sui Yuan's eyes. He freezes, arms still outstretched in preparation to pull Sui Yuan into his embrace. His heart that was thudding in anticipation all but stops beating. Glaring frostily at Qin Zheng, Sui Yuan remains where he is, not saying a word and not moving an inch. The former is due to his belief that not saying anything will prevent things from going haywire, the latter due to him not having the strength to even get to his feet. Qin Zheng lets his arms fall back to his side, staring wordlessly at Sui Yuan. Sorrow and understanding flash through his eyes. With heavy steps, he halts before Sui Yuan, then gets down on one knee and envelopes the other man in a tight hug, as if afraid that Sui Yuan will disappear. Sui Yuan can only wordlessly shoot 5,237 desperate glances to request its help. But the system blatantly ignores him, rolling around in grief as it wails this is a BG world, not a BL world AHH what do I do now, endlessly, sounding like a broken record. Hearing this, another thought strikes Sui Yuan. He needs to try turning this world back to a BG one. Get out of my sight, I don't wish to see you anymore, Sui Yuan says icily. I understand, but your body is in a very bad condition and needs to be carefully tended, Qin Zheng replies, tone remorseful. At least stay until you have recovered fully, then you can take your revenge on me, okay? You must not make life difficult for yourself. Weighing his options, Sui Yuan feels that refusing Qin Zheng would be useless. In addition, he cannot stay in this cell for the rest of his life, right? In the end, he silently agrees to Qin Zheng's proposal. Wait until after his body fully recovers, he will naturally continue to follow the story. To be honest, he actually likes the upcoming event in store for the supporting male lead. He has always wanted to see the mountains and large rivers. Receiving the consent of the person in his embrace, Qin Zheng exhales a relieved breath. Gathering the silent man in his arms, he belatedly notices that Sui Yuan is light as a feather, thin to the point of being mere skin and bones. Heart souring. Qin Zheng tightens his hold on him and ensures his movements are as gentle as possible, as though the person he is carrying is a fragile and delicate treasure. Afterwards, Sui Yuan is brought into the previous emperor's Qin palace, fed with delicious food like a pig being reared before slaughter. The newly crowned emperor Qin Zheng can be said to be especially doting. If Sui Yuan wants a star, he will give it to him. If he asks for the moon, it will be placed in his hands. Only, it's a pity that Sui Yuan has an unyielding personality on top of being a very dedicated worker. No matter how the other man tries to explain himself or excuse his actions, he simply uses one word of hate to solve all problems, effectively pushing everything away. The only sole regret he had was that there is no way to change the story back to BG, which makes him extremely worried. Every time he thinks about the evaluation he will receive after finishing this mission, he will simply feel like drowning himself. Where in the world did he go wrong? He followed the original plot as best he could ah. Being a supporting male lead is really not easy. Pei, 
When Sui Yuan regains his fair and healthy appearance, he feels that he has recuperated fully, so the first thing he brings up the next time he sees Qin Zheng is about leaving the capital. Complying with the script, his reason for leaving is broken-hearted, incapable of facing his old love, no, wait, it should be old friend, who killed his family, and not able to forgive himself for having a hand in it, he will travel the world in order to heal his soul. Staring intensely at Sui Yuan, Qin Zheng's expression is deeply grieved. You are truly unwilling to forgive me? Unwilling to give me a final chance? Resolutely shaking his head, Sui Yuan persists on bidding farewell. To hell with this BL world? Even if he is incapable of changing it back to BG, he absolutely cannot change the supporting male lead's original ending? Hopefully, the system will look favorably upon his dedication to his work and give him a satisfactory reward at the end of all this. QAQ. I understand. Qin Zheng heaves a resigned sigh, dark eyes miserable. You are the only one who stayed back waiting for me when I wandered for so long, the only one who sacrificed his all for my well-being. But I didn't cherish what I had. It is my mistake. Lifting his hand, he runs gentle fingers along Sui Yuan's ink black hair. I said before that the moment you recovered, no matter what kind of revenge you would like to enact, I will gladly accept, not having my deepest wish fulfilled. I suppose this can be considered as payback. Sui Yuan deliberately shifts his head, neatly evading Qin Zheng's hand as though a mere touch is intolerable. Qin Zheng's lips thin, the hand left hanging in midair clenching tightly until the veins bulge. A good while later, he abruptly stands and strides swiftly away towards the window. Staring out at the lush spring scenery and the warm sunlight shining down from the heavens, he feels no joy, no peace. His heart has become wintry cold. Eyelids sliding shut, Qin Zheng eventually utters a single, grave word. Go. Climbing off the bed, Sui Yuan serenely bows to Qin Zheng's back before walking slowly out of the room, straight-backed and graceful as ever. Like Qin Zheng on the day they parted ways in the 10,000 miles pavilion, he doesn't look back even once. Far from the capital, far from his old friend, roaming freely across mountains and rivers, Sui Yuan has at long last neared the end of a bumpy road that is his first mission. His first world. This calls for a celebration, indeed worthy of a celebration. 5237, why do I feel like crying? QAQ. Zhao Zai has long lost count of how many worlds he has drifted through, and how long he has been doing so. From a small pawn that could only follow the system's command to a VIP level actor who can influence his system. Along this tedious journey, every preset plot with its love, affection, hate, and feelings in general all came and went like smoke and mist. None ever left the slightest bit of impression in his heart. Just as Zhao Zai starts to believe that he is perhaps meant to wander through worlds alone, his system finally informs him that he has obtained the highest level credit. Meaning, he can do as he wishes, live as he wishes in all the different worlds laid out for his picking. If he finds someone he likes, he can choose to remain by her side forever. Initially, the Zhao Zai who received this news finally experienced genuine and sincere joy. However, this happiness quickly disappears, dissipating without a trace. Because no matter how much effort he puts in, he is incapable of finding someone able to ignite the spark in his heart. In the various worlds, he interacted with many different kinds of women. Flirtatious ones, ice-cold queens, tyrants, enchanters, his experience is rather vast. Unfortunately, Zhao Zai has long lost the ability to genuinely love someone, for his heart has frosted over. But whatever the case is, he continues drifting through the worlds, searching, harboring the scantest hope that someday, he will be able to meet with that person. The one who can make him feel again. Arriving in another ancient era world, Zhao Zai is already very familiar with the best way to deal with the plot. As soon as he has a brief understanding of the character and role he is meant to play, he tosses it all aside, instead wandering down the street to pass the time. It isn't long before his gaze is attracted to a young man gorgeous enough to catch everyone's attention. Zhao Zai has never before seen such an enchantingly captivating person, male or female, that causes him to be unable to shift his gaze away. Even if he is clearly arrogant and spoiled, his eyes display a childlike innocence, clear and untainted. Although it doesn't quite fit the aura he exudes, it still doesn't fail in capturing people's interest. With nothing better to do, Zhao Zai decides to tail the man. He is just so bored, enough that he desires to interact with the one interesting thing that aroused his curiosity. As such, 
He clearly witnessed this young man exclaim at every common item like a sheltered child, purchasing random items like a carved hairpin and a wooden button, things that shouldn't incite such happiness in people. Coupled with his enticing outer appearance, this attitude truly makes one unable to stop staring. In the end, when Zhao Zai really wants to interact with this interesting character, he is given the opportunity to do so when the other looks around, a tad embarrassed. Taking the initiative, he offers to carry the pile of random items for him. Later, when everything is said and done, Zhao Zai finally realizes that this person is this world's supporting male lead, Sui Yuan. Regarding the female lead, he has no interest in her. Rather than allowing the storyline to develop the way it is meant to, he prefers finding novel and interesting things. In addition, he has the power to do as he wishes. Hence, he tosses the female lead aside, shadowing Sui Yuan day to day. While this youth generally appears haughty and bossy, he is, in fact, a naive white paper one. Zhao Zai really likes the feel of being unrestrained, smearing this white paper with his colors. It gives him an unparalleled sense of accomplishment. Cultivating someone, especially such a gorgeous child, is truly satisfactory enough to kill his boredom. It is in this world Zhao Zai feels, for the first time in his life, that he is someone without integrity. He likes using an ambiguous attitude to treat Sui Yuan. Seeing him, S.Y., confused, but struggling to maintain a calm and collected front gradually cause him to be more and more engrossed. But no matter what surfaced in his heart, his mind is still clear-headed as ever from beginning to the end. In his eyes, everything in each world is merely a plaything to ease his boredom. It's just that, the toy named Sui Yuan truly leaves him at a loss. Nonetheless, Zhao Zai thinks that since Sui Yuan brings him such delight, he should at least repay him by making him happy in this world. Although the original plot has Sui Yuan destined to be a mere supporting lead cannon fodder, as long as he, this male lead, doesn't get involved, with Sui Yuan's appearance alone, it shouldn't be long before the beauty will be in his grasp. Only, everything veers out of Zhao Zai's expectations. First of all, Sui Yuan's behavior. He is clearly desperately head over heels for the female lead, but simply refuses to admit it, causing Zhao Zai to lament in his heart. Secondly, his ambiguous attitude to Sui Yuan came back to bite him, for he feels like Sui Yuan is slowly starting to develop feelings for him. When he leaves for the front lines as according to the plot, the grief-stricken song that Sui Yuan plays causes his long-frozen heart to palpitate. It is here that his emotions start to undulate. If Sui Yuan is able to accompany him, Zhao Zai considers that he is a rather good choice. However, he is well aware that he is a cold individual who has existed without love for so long. Rather than being tied to him, perhaps Sui Yuan will find genuine happiness with Fan Kao. Therefore, Zhao Zai doesn't respond, doesn't turn back until he is far, far away, where he can't hear the zither nor see the player. He has made the decision to sever his ambiguous relationship with Sui Yuan. However, one is incapable of controlling their hearts and thus, he fails yet again. Although he is stationed far away from the capital, Zhao Zai doesn't stop monitoring Sui Yuan. With an informant shadowing the young prince and reporting his every move, Zhao Zai knows every little thing concerning Sui Yuan. Hence, he is well aware of Sui Yuan becoming listless after his departure, of him drifting apart from the female lead. Fan Kao eventually married, but he still remained single. Everything is reported back to Zhao Zai, leaving him fretting and worrying. The crucial turning point in the plot is something Zhao Zai is incapable of thwarting, and is also something he doesn't want to waste effort in preventing. The family he has in the form of Marquis Dingyuan's household are no more than faceless strangers. He will do what he can and follow the plot, but he doesn't put any of them in his heart. However, following Fan Kao's unscripted marriage and departure, the Whirlpool originally planned to suck the female lead into once again draws Sui Yuan in. As if decreed by fate, Sui Yuan tirelessly works to support the Marquis residence in standing firm against the Emperor, even going so far as risking his life to help the entire household sneak out of the capital. This all is not because he harbors a deep love for the female lead, but rather, because he dearly loves the male lead. This is first time someone has thrown away everything for him even after the storyline has changed the first person that left an unforgettable impression on his stone heart. After receiving news that Sui Yuan has been thrown into prison and will quite possibly be executed for treason, he finally experiences a tidal wave of emotion. Remorse, self-blame, agony akin to having his heart cut out. 
Suffice to say that this onslaught of emotions reminds him that he is a genuine person, infatuated with the only man that can make him feel this way without even being physically present. Zhao Zai finally admits that he feels something for this young prince. Whenever he recalls that delicate, arrogant but feeble-minded, pure, simple, and utterly sincere child, fondness and worry arises. He desperately wants to fight and push forward the date of the revolt, for presently, he knows that Sui Yuan is not dead yet. He is locked up in a prison cell, still alive. Zhao Zai thinks that perhaps he has found the person he is seeking, the sole individual able to make him feel again. Sui Yuan the one who deviated from the original story and fell for him even after seeing Zhao Zai's true self. The one who is willing to even throw away his life without complaints all for him. The beautiful, pure child, Sui Yuan. Perhaps this feeling Zhao Zai has for Sui Yuan is not love, but concern. Even so, something that isn't as deep as love is also fine. Zhao Zai is truly weary from all that drifting. He just wants someone who can capture his attention and willingness to be with then spend the rest of his life with them, walking towards the future together. Harboring this sliver of hope, Zhao Zai rushes into the prison. Mere skin and bones, clothes matted with dirt and hair in disarray, Sui Yuan still looks heartbreakingly beautiful, so captivating that Zhao Zai cannot bring himself to look away, clinging on to this child with a death grip as if Sui Yuan is the only piece of driftwood out in sea that is preventing him from drowning. Zhao Zai gives it his all, trying his utmost best to please Sui Yuan and heal the emotional wounds he inflicted. But perhaps this is fate's retribution, for Sui Yuan never opens his heart to him again. Ultimately, Sui Yuan still leaves as according to the plot, departing from the capital with a broken heart. In the end, the person Zhao Zai wishes to grab hold of and never let go slips away between his fingers like air. He can do nothing, only carving this person, Sui Yuan, deep into his heart. When this storyline reaches its conclusion, Zhao Zai once again finds himself in the space between worlds. To his utter amazement, the first thing he sees is the enchanting figure clad in crimson robes, a vision that he has been missing for years. Sui Yuan is still as striking as ever, only lacking the languid, enticing charm. But the pure and simple expression displayed on his face is extremely familiar. By his side, a similar round-bodied system screeches sharply as it relays everything that its partner did wrong in the previous world. Spotting Zhao Zai, Sui Yuan pauses for a second, before flashing him a friendly smile. That's right. Friendly. Not the cold disdainful look that tore at Zhao Zai's heart. At this moment, if Zhao Zai still cannot grasp the situation, then the thing occupying that space in his skull is not a brain. Teeth gnashing together as he stares at the spot Sui Yuan disappeared from. He reaches out and drags his own system over, coldly questioning, which world did he go into? The zombie apocalypse one, the system answers calmly. Are you sure you want to pick that zombie apocalypse world? Of course, I am certain. The corners of Zhao Zai's mouth pulls up in a humorless smile. After wandering for so long and becoming a senior in this line, I unexpectedly got played by a newbie. If I don't take my revenge, even the heavens will weep.